Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mutiny, a 25 North fan cast. I'm a hungry little goblin, Johnny. And I'm uh, Rachel. I am also here, although not a hungry little goblin currently. Uh, oh, okay, okay. What, what, what would you say you are uh, ancestry-wise right now? Ancestry-wise? I don't know, probably an ooze. I'm a little under the weather once again, so uh, just a blob. That's probably not an ancestry, though, right? That's a archetype. You know, I'm glad to report topical. that. Uh, uh, thank you to Battle Zoo. Um, uh, Ooze is now an ancestry. Word, word to Battle Zoo uh, and their Year of Monsters. Yeah. Um, they've, they've got a, they've got an ooze ancestry, or, or I'm sorry, a slime ancestry. That's right. Uh, and I believe I believe a, a uh, one of the one of the heritages is uh, an ooze. Okay. Ooze is a sub. Is it Oozkin? I think it is. Okay. I have not looked that closely yet, but I do love all the Battle Zoo stuff. Ancestries and whatnot, so. Yeah. Outstanding stuff. Love them. <laughs> uh, but it's true that there are a bunch of things that are sort of ancestries and sort of archetypes. And uh, you're entirely right. Thank you for your, your excellent segue there <laughs> uh, into the topic of today's discussion which is archetyping uh, in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And uh, we talked, we briefly discussed this and we figured that um, it would make a lot of sense for us to, to begin with the broader context. And uh, I am into a bunch of Bizarro games, uh, but Rachel, you are into some of the OG games. So uh, we're going to do a brief segment here that we call Multiclassing Through the Ages. <laughs> Yeah, and what better place to start than first ed AD and D, since that is the foundation of all of our Pathfinder and really all of our RPGs, in my opinion. Or, yeah. So in first ed D and D, there was two ways that you could multi-class, uh, which it's funny. Uh, one was for human characters, and one was for non-human characters because. Deep first ed D&D like to make up lots of rules just in general uh, so if you were human the you could go up in one class say fighter and then at any point you could say I'm not a fighter anymore I'm going to be a thief or whatever and you would retain your hit points but you could not use any of your fighter abilities you would have to start as a level one thief work all the way up until you reach the same level as your original class, and then you would regain the abilities of your original class while only being allowed to advance in your secondary class um, for the rest of your character's life. Uh, so that's how humans did it, uh, which is weird. That's a really fascinating one. Like the, I guess the the idea is to introduce like a really large cost. Um, it, mm -hmm. but, yeah, uh, even even at level three or so, that's like crippling. Like that is, that removes so much of I don't know your your features. Right, and then you're stuck at like whatever your original class is is never getting leveled up again. So if you stop at level three, that's it. You're done. You're never getting more fighter level three in this example, or fighter levels in this example. So yeah, it's kind of brutal. Um, the second way to do it, and only non-humans could do this, was the actual multi-classed character in which you would choose your two classes at the beginning. Um, each, what we now call Ancestry, had certain options available to them, and you would, every time you got XP, you would divide it between the two classes, and then they'd level up simultaneously, but independently, which is especially of note because the classes did not level up at the same pace in first edition. Uh, yeah, they all had a different progression arc. Uh, ma magic users took a long time to get their first few levels. Thiefs leveled up right away. So your thief might just be zooming through the levels, your thief half, and then your wizard half would be slowly plodding along for a while. So, yeah the crazy over-complexion of First Ed. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, that's that's fascinating. There, there's so much. Uh, it feels uh, like a very punitive kind of system. Like if you if you want to trot off the beaten path at all, there's a, there's enormous cost to everything. Oh yeah, yeah. If you want to try to get those benefits, and there really were benefits. You know, it was hugely restrictive about what items you could use, what weapon types you could use, and so if you wanted to be a, f- a cleric who could use a, an edged weapon. That was the only way you had to take the hit and multi-class into fighter and be a ancestry that allowed it. So, yeah, it's very restrictive, but very uh, opened up the restrictions in other ways. So, yeah. So it seems like it's uh, very restrictive, uh, very, like, I, I think... Um, that, that that works for me. Uh, to, to call that like very restrictive and very very binary, very mm-hmm. on or off. Right? Like you are you are a fighter up until you just quit being a friggin' fighter right. uh, temporarily and then kind of permanently. In the sense that you know if you were to begin the multi class three, you, that's kind of where you're frozen in amber for a long time. Right. Yes, and I've, for the human version where you build up one stop and then build up the other. If you ever use the abilities of that first class while you're leveling up your second class, you don't gain the XP for that encounter whenever you used it. So if you are backed in a corner, you want to use that fireball spell you saved up, you can do it and you will get zero XP for whatever you just did with it. So yeah, it's very, very punitive, as you said. All right, so so that's uh, that's first edition, and mm-hmm. um, uh, if, if I recall right, even being non-human itself took some shenanigans mm-hmm. to get yeah. to that like multi-classing easy track. Oh yeah, I mean or, there's I think easy. yeah there's rules about the ability scores you can and can't have for each you know heritage and each class and the levels that each heritage is allowed to get for each class. It's very it's very rule heavy, uh, old, old uh, system. So, I mean, yeah. anything for a, for a higher or maybe lower Seiko, I'm not sure whether a high one is good or not. Um, you know, like I said, this is not this is not my my uh, not what I cut my teeth. Yeah, when I forget which edition did you come in on? Uh, you know, I played a lot of Shadowrun in my in my Wayward Youth. Uh, and then uh, I actually only got into sort of the fantasy D20 stuff uh, with D&D 5th edition. Okay. All right. So how how did it work well, in? Sort of, I, I played some Earth Dawn, which was put out by the same company as Shadowrun back in the day, but was clearly their attempt to cut themselves a slice of, uh, I guess it must have been 3.5. Okay. D&D. Sure. And that's all uh, D6 based, right? Shadowrun? Shadowrun is D6 based. It's, it's pools, right? It's, it's big on dice pools, like you might see in uh, Lady Blackbird, um, is, is one of those games that is also based on that. And a bunch of little micro games. I'm pretty sure uh, Honey Heist also relies on pools. Um, and there are a bunch of things that are like, you know, any, any kind of like dice uh, game that also is resource heavy. Uh, uh, is not actually a D twenty fantasy game in this very mainstream vein. tends to tends to rely on right. So uh, so after after first edition, uh, I think I think you 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 still have the the next runner up in the chronology. You still are uh, looking at what D and D fourth edition uh, fourth or... ed. Yeah, yeah. So I did play fourth ed. Uh, I did not ever multi-class, so I had to pull out my old book and learn or relearn, who knows. Uh, And it looks like in 4th ed there was a specific feat for each class and at a certain point you could just take that feat. It would give you a specific benefit and that was how you multi-classed. So you might take the I'm looking at it right now, the cleric Feet, and now you are considered a cleric for anything that needs cleric prerequisites, and you get, you know, to use a small amount of cleric abilities. Um, and then, you know, at certain points you can take an additional multi-class feat. Um, so, 
yeah, I, again, I did not actually play this, so I'm not entirely sure, but... Right, right. I played 4th Ed. I did not use multi-classing, so... Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one, uh, because it sounds like you are... So do you gain sort of, like, let's say that you are a rogue. Mm -hmm. uh, I can just kind of assume that they're in every edition, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, let's say that you are a rogue and you are multiclassing into cleric, as you said. Okay. Uh, you take this, you take this, uh, what sounds like the equivalent of a dedication feat. Right. Um, and, uh, and you are considered a cleric for anything that, any of those prerequisites, is that, does that include like cleric feats? Are you, are you considered to be like your full level in cleric at that point? Uh, I'm not sure about full level, but you're definitely considered to be a cleric, um, so that you can take other cleric feats. The example they list is if you multi-class in, or take the rogue multi-class feat, you will gain a sneak attack as a class feature, and then you can take, use that as a prereq for, like, a backstabber feat, which is a thief feat. So yeah, you can, depending on what it gives you, it will count as a prereq for other feats. Um, okay, I see, I see. So, uh, it sounds to me like they are relying on like level gating feats as a way of containing power and, and kind of keeping that from being abused. And then it also sounds like they are relying on feat chains as like another one of those gateways um, that, that just kind of keeps you from from being, you know, the the in the example of Pathfinder 2e, imagine a fighter that also could do a Magus spell strike, like. It, it would be way, way, way too strong if uh, a fighter could just do like this enormously powerful blow every single round uh, with no problems like that. So, um, you know, that's why archetyping is kind of as, as different as it is. So at this point, we've, we've looked at uh, fifth edition, we've looked at fourth edition. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly interject with Shadowrun here before we go on to the way that the D&D fifth edition works. In, in the case of Shadowrun, it's a classless system, but you sort of buy your way into magic at character creation. That's the one, that your, your, your heritage and your magic status are sort of the two things that you kind of cannot buy later uh, in, in Shadowrun. So you really have to, um, you have to have like a lot of foresight uh, with what you want to do. Um, and as far as that one goes, uh, uh, as long as you, you figured out what you wanted, you could buy, you know, some cyber cyberware for yourself. You could, uh, you know, toss in a, a cool electronic eyeball or, or something along those lines. Um, and it would have some knock-on effects, right? It, it, would, it would make you better with a gun uh, because now you can see, you know, that much sharper or whatever. You can integrate this eyeball with your pistol's sight um, which is, you know, super neat. On the other hand, uh, as you uh, as you replace parts of your physical body, you also lose your spiritual essence. Uh, and spiritual essence is a big driver of your magical potency. And so, um, sort of the container there was, uh, um, yes, you can get this cyberware, but it, it will uh, lower your magical, uh, you know, uh, your, your sort of base magical level uh, and so there's not really a ton of you know a ton of synergy to be had uh, unless you got extremely 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 highly leveled um, and so uh, you know for the most part you wouldn't see a lot of crossover where um, you would have a spellcaster who would uh, have like a ton of cyberware uh, and and all these uh, sort of weird things like that um, that and you know the other thing too is that all of your attacks were just skills, and skills were kind of easy to raise, uh, you know, regardless of, of what you were doing. So uh, I don't know, like that that one. They they gateway that one by making it so that everything is kind of anti spiritual If you are a street samurai, um, you know you're kind of not really able to buy your way into magic. And if you're a magic user or a physical adept, uh, which is sort of the um, the magic strong body monk, you know, like uh, using magic to power your own uh, your own cool bodily feats. Uh, it's sort of the magic version of the street samurai. Um, 
if you did that, then you wouldn't want to get a lot of cyberware because that would impinge upon your own magical ability. Uh, so, generally speaking, you wouldn't see a lot of like quote unquote multi-classing in uh, in there, but you would occasionally see somebody, for example, a physical adept, uh, who would take a smart link so that they could fire their pistol a little bit better. That was that was as far as the trade-off would go. Usually, you wouldn't see people really commit to a full, you know, 50-50 multi-class because of the anti-synergies that exist. Sure. Getting better at one is directly negative to the other one. Is that what kind of the uh, nugget? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. It, it is a great cost. And uh, magic is profoundly expensive in terms of the, the, the progression, the XP uh, cost. Um, they call it karma in that system, uh, or at least they did when I was playing it. Um, it, it was just profoundly expensive to be able to raise your base magic stat. You would have to go on just dozens and dozens of incredibly difficult missions to, uh, to be able to do that. And so um, you wouldn't want to wreck that by tossing something into your skull. By tossing a keyboard into your skull is just not, not really worth it. In life. Sure, sure. Yes, right, so look, Shadow Run talk always just, I tried playing it once, just goes right over my head. Such a complex system, but I think I get what you're saying. They, yeah. they really have made, I think, some strides in streamlining things because they had these like three competing pillars of hacking and rigging and physical combat and magical stuff. And uh, all three of those exist in different planes of reality. Uh, and so your team would wind up not really working together very well. And then what would happen especially is um, if your team was not all Street Samurai, uh, then the GM had to know the rules, which were all vastly different across all three of those pillars. The GM had to know the rules for the Matrix combat versus Astral combat versus physical combat. Um, and it really wound up being a total pain in the neck for whoever was uh, actually trying to run the game. They've made some massive strides toward unifying all these things and streamlining everything, uh, so that you know, um, uh, so that your your matrix combat has rules that look a lot more similar to your astral combat, which looks a little bit more like your physical combat now, uh, which helps a lot in terms of the rules overload. Uh, but I think that in terms of their character builds, I think they've moved so that physical adepts no longer are just the magical versions of street samurai instead have their own like super weird bonkers abilities um, but in the end uh in that game um there was such a i don't know like you you wind up even then i think um not wanting to, to branch out too, too much because um if you want to be good at matrix stuff you have to give up like three bonus magic points out of your six that you oh have wow play. okay yeah it, it is truly like painful painful uh, for you to, to, to do a lot of mixing and matching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's, then... that's Shadowrun for you. That's, that's a little bit of, <laughs> that's a peek at a dystopian cyber future. Uh, right. Nothing like the one in which we presently live. Um, now, let's take a look though at, uh, speaking of dystopian cyber futures, let's talk about what Wizards of the Coast has. Uh, that's a little joke about their sort of virtual tabletop plans. Ah, uh, that's anyway, right. Yeah, I got, got them so good, they're never going to recover from that. <laughs> no. Um, anyway, uh, uh, let's talk about how multiclassing uh, works in 5th edition. Okay. This is another one in your court, right? I've not played right. very much. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, so, multiclassing in 5th edition is, like so many other things in 5th edition, exceedingly streamlined. Uh, it is streamlined to the point that I think it is kind of a brilliant des design decision, but it comes, it loops back around to being sort of um, a, 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 a very uh, confined design decision. Too. So uh, the way that it works in 5th edition is you are, say, a level 1 rogue and you want to take level 1 cleric. Alright, you get a level up and you say, cool, this level is for you, Cleric. And you get no advancement whatsoever in Rogue. None. You only get your level in Cleric, and now you've got one level in Cleric, uh, and you've got, you know, whatever else levels that you already had extant in Rogue. Um, 
That means that a lot and, and so much of your advancement is tied into these level ups in, inside of these individual classes, right? Like that's where all of your, all of your goodies comes from, all of your progression and so on. And so what this means is that you fall behind a lot in terms of your sort of core class. Now it is as if you are an entire level behind and considering we mostly play these games at level one to 10, uh, if you fall even one level behind in your core competency, you can kind of feel it. Um, one of the strange things about fifth edition is that they made all of these classes or they tended to make these classes kind of top heavy so that um, it actually did make a lot of sense for you to dip out for one level you would get a lot of interesting neat goodies like you know uh, you're, you're, you would get like one dice of sneak attack and, or you know a ton of new skills that you would pick up or, um, you know you would pick you would get uh, uh, hunt prey or whatever the equivalent was uh, I forget okay. the ranger thing. so by top heavy you mean at first level you get access to a good amount of stuff goodies and goodies and goodies absolutely Absolutely. So, like, uh, uh, the temptation is always going to be there for you to take a level of Warlock um, because then you have these spell slots that come back on short rest so you can use them every single combat. Uh, and there are nice spells even at level one that are useful to have every single combat, like Sheep and Force and like that. Um, and that that is a it, it feels like a very good design decision because it is very easy to understand. I just I don't go forward in rogue, but I do go forward in cleric, and um, and each of these classes acts as their own container, and I can just stack the containers on top of each other. Right. Uh, what you run into is that um, because everything is so top heavy, uh, your first couple of levels are super strong. Um, then you wind up having a lot of people um, wanting to dip around a lot because having these different points of contact uh, between your features allows for neat synergies to form uh, and you wind up um, making it so that it is uh, you fall behind if you stay single class almost. Um, oh, these interesting. Synergies, these synergies are so strong that if you don't um, get yourself a little bit of versatility uh, and you just progress sort of straight down the line. For example, with Fighter, um, again, we're playing these games mostly between level 1 and 10. Uh, if, if you're just playing a, a Fighter all the way through from 1 to 10 in D&D 5th Edition, you are missing every boat humanly possible. Like, it is, it is a wild thing for you to do to just play a, a Fighter all the way through. Um, because, you know, there, there are these big, enormous wads of dead dead levels uh, where, you know, you get what are called ribbon abilities. And, and when you look at the um, their design sheet, uh, they put out like a guide uh, right when 5th edition came out. They said, okay, here's, here was our design document for these classes. We don't want any class to have more skills than the rogue. We want that to be the top end of the rogue, uh, of the skills uh, classes. And we also... Uh, you know, want to want to have, um, uh, sorry. We also want to have entire levels, uh, maybe you know, fifth level, maybe seventh level. Uh, we want to have those uh, be occupied by ribbon abilities. There are going to be some abilities that are big mechanical abilities, and these levels are going to feel very big, uh, especially when you translate between tiers of play. So. At level five, there's this enormous power spike in fifth edition. Um, that's when your wizard gets fireball. That's when your marshals get their extra attacks. Um, you know, that it's it's a it's a really big juicy one. But um, generally speaking, level six, level seven uh, tend to be these ribbon abilities. Like your uh, thieves' camp is a really classic example of a ribbon ability, where uh, okay, I can communicate with somebody on the DL. Um, but, you know, that doesn't make me stronger in combat. It doesn't even make me that much better, like, exploring or, you know, That's getting a around a dungeon. thing you have to gain in 5th Ed? Sorry, you got distracted. Thieves are my go-to class, and in 1st Ed, you just start with that as a language. Okay. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, you do get that as part of your first level uh, in Rogue, right? Um, but, you know, the, that, that one is a good example of a, a ribbon ability. Um, I see. Okay. There's another one, too, where uh, uh, the purple dragon knight 
uh, which is a subclass of fighter in fifth edition. Very poorly received because uh, it has a couple of ribbon abilities that are not actually very useful that have to do with, um, I think you get advantage on diplomacy checks when you're interacting with nobles of a specific region. Oh, uh, oof. right, right, and it, yeah. you know, it's not intended to be strong. Like it, you're not, you're not supposed to have these massive power bumps every single level, or you know things like that. But as a result of this, uh, you know, reasonable design decision uh, to have some levels be powerful uh, in terms of you know your core combat or, or your core gameplay, and some less means that you have these big dead levels. Uh, like if you're a fighter, you're staring down the barrel of level six and level seven. It's like Okay, I, this is this is the this is the peas I've got to eat before I get my dessert, you know, sure. of, of my third attack at level ten, and the temptation to skip straight to, all right, now I'm a hexblade warlock, and I've got shield on tap now, and I can do this, you know, magical smite thing on my my attack. Ooh, that's a that's a hard that's a hard one not right. to take that. One. So um, all dessert all the time. It, Exactly. And so the, you wind up having, like, there are really pretty passable builds uh, out there for this edition that are like, yeah, I took three of this level and three of this level and three of this level. And uh, it all worked out pretty, pretty sweet. Um, so th that's that's one of the weird things about this edition is, is that um, they they made it so that some things are so much stronger than other things that it's foolish not to take them. This is you know that that's a, that's part of what some people call the balance of the game uh, in some respects. Well, and then um, that whole and so, oh, go ahead. Sorry. And so you know that that um, that just kind of uh, uh, makes you wonder, like, where is the where is the gating here? What, what is it that keeps this power from being abused? And the answer is very little. As long as you've got the levels to spend, um, you're going to be able to produce something that's like really wacky, uh, out of scope with. Um, with uh, what comes straight out of the box. If you do a fighter with a couple of levels of something else, you can get really way funkier than just a straight up and down fighter. And um, that that makes it so that there's a strong mechanical encouragement to do it, uh, almost like a tax uh, on not doing it. Okay. Interesting. I was going to say the stacking, segueing, uh, is the same as how multi-classing works in First Ed Pathfinder. Uh, that every time you level, y you just choose a class, as far as I know. Choose a class and put a level in. I will uh, asterisk this. I've only played Pathfinder at a relatively high level, so I don't know the balances and checks in place or you know, how you would make these choices if you were actually first level, deciding where to put your second level. I've only been at 10th level choosing how to distribute all 10 levels, but it's the same idea that you get a level, you choose a class, you put it in, and that class is now just one level higher, just like as you're describing fifth ed, so yeah. Which, you know, Pathfinder 1 predates 5th Ed, which perhaps a little uh, cross ideas there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, let's then talk about uh, what's going on with Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And um, this one really is, uh, it's an entirely different approach uh, to, yeah, to multi-classing or uh, as it is called in this game, archetyping. Um, the idea here is that you are always your core class, period. Uh, and there are, um, you, you, most of your power comes from the core class that you pick and it comes from the core features of that core class. These are things that you don't pick feats for. Just as you level up, you get, you know, weapon specialization, greater weapon specialization, you get your sneak attack, regardless of what else is going on or, or of any archetype you choose to do. Um, so there is, uh, instead, you take, um, using your class feats, uh, you can take archetype dedications, uh, which are sort of, this occupies the slot of one of your class feats. Uh, it's one of the choices that you can make uh, instead of taking one from your own class. 
uh, and you can begin exploring another another class. And this basically buys you entry. This archetype, this dedication, archetype dedication fee, buys you entry into checking out what's uh, what's meaningful from this other class. Now there are kind of two big gates on it, or yeah, sort of two big gates. Uh, number one is the level requirement of all the feats. Um, it is especially well contained because. Uh, if you look at the advanced uh, uh, feats of most of your multi-classing, it says you can take a class feat from this other class, but only uh, your your character level counts as half, as high, for the purpose of taking these feats. So if I'm a level 20 fighter, I can finally take a level 10 monk. That's that's that is one of the really good gateways. And they ensure that way that you are, like, if you're a fighter and you spend every single class beat on wizard, you're still no wizard at all. You are still very much a fighter with, like, a little splash and sprinkle. Uh, it, it, it is um, the way that I have heard uh, the archetyping system um, referred to in, in, in this system is uh, it is a lot like White Claw. And uh, White Claw, uh, the, the beverage, is uh has been has been described as like sipping television static while someone whispers the flavor in the next room so there is just like a very it's, it's a it's a little tiny hint uh of, of whatever else it is that you're archetyping into but uh where i think this thing really kind of gets some legs is outside of multi-classing okay multi-classing as we've been discussing is is this you know, I feel like we're now we now we're panning out. We're we're zooming out to to reveal that there's a, a massive universe here. You know, like this, now archetyping uh, means that you don't necessarily have to be multi-classing, uh, and it changes the the scope of the things that you can expand into the progression paths that you can take. Uh, in fact, right now I believe there's some something along the lines of 135 archetypes in Pathfinder 2. Okay. I had no idea there was that many. Yes, indeed. Well, I mean, there are 22 classes into which uh, one might expand. Uh, right. Eight, so you're already, you know, cooking with a lot of gas in terms of just having those multi-class archetypes. But uh, I think it's really worth paying a lot of attention to uh, the other uh, strange ways that you can expand or progress uh, your character. Um, the ghost is an archetype. The ghoul, the vampire, as we all know from the Book of Dead, uh, those are all archetypes. The Turpin Row Lumberjack. You can. They have a. They have a, a feat called Log Roll, where if uh, if you and an opponent are both standing on a log, you can move the log and make them flat-footed. Oh wow, that's very specific. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of these things are from when they were first designing the game. And they weren't really too sure how people would actually use archetypes, and uh, uh, so there there are a bunch of them uh, in the advanced player's guide, which was uh, the, the book that introduced the idea of archetypes. Wound up being a little bit half baked and a little bit too narrow. The pirate, for example, uh, yep. might also fall into that one. You know, we we took a look at that one for Twenty Five North. I think everybody must have mm -hmm. yeah. taken a little peek at that. Um, but that one has stuff like. Uh, you can make people walk the plank, but only if you're on a boat and have a plank nearby. It's like, oh, wow, okay. Oh, I'm, mm, that you one's not need a do very that. specific campaign to make it worthwhile. Yeah. Absolutely. Now that said, uh, you know, it is worth, it is uh, pretty interesting that um, you can, you can take these things to add a little bit of flavor or definition to your character. And I think um, that that leads us pretty neatly into the the uh, the next sort of part of this, which is um, there is an ongoing debate in Pathfinder 2e uh, about, or at least not a debate. It is it is a matter of preference on a table by table basis as to whether uh, uh, one should use free archetypes. And if you go out there and you look at the, the videos that are available on YouTube uh, that are about you know what 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 should I know about Pathfinder? Um, everybody says, you need to play with free archetypes. Right. It is a super common refrain. And uh, I think that that 
is that, that having these lower, uh, these lower level, um, more flavorish archetypes like your pirate or your turpin row lumberjack tends to really, uh, uh, you're, you're not really going to use that a lot, right? It's kind of like how, you know, uh, in, in D and D fifth edition, uh, you don't want to have any dead levels, right? Cause you, that progress could be used to do something else. Um, what is really, really, really nice about archetyping in Pathfinder 2e is, uh, if you take free archetype, you can just do this. Those aren't, those aren't like, you, you aren't going to be losing out on anything if we have free archetype. So to take these choices that are more flavor, uh, I've, I'm playing as a rogue for this upcoming Kingmaker game I'm going to be in. And, uh, I'm absolutely going to be taking the dandy archetype. Uh, which a lot of people regard as the most just flavory, do nothing kind of archetype. But hey, that's that's the kind of character that uh, the keys is. Um, so free archetype kind of lowers the barrier to entry for you to, to to make these kind of character decisions. Which I think is especially nice. Uh, I know when I first started Pathfinder, I struggled a lot with not just archetype feats, but feats in general. That it just seemed like so many of them were flavor and it took me a while to realize that Pathfinder seems to be balanced enough already and giving you enough with your basic class advancement that you get to do the flavor you get to make your character actually different and meaningful and personal instead of just a generic fighter or a generic magic user so that you know the free archetypes really builds on that and gives you the ability to not worry about optimizing and how that's going to be a detriment to the whole party. If you don't optimize, you can just do something that makes sense and makes your character personal to you, um, I would say. Um, and I'd, I'd like to get to the, to the point about optimizing. Uh, yeah. You know, it's no secret that I think a lot about um, how the game is played and, and how it should be played well and uh, mm-hmm. you know, how, how do these mechanics actually work and, and you know what is what is uh, what is ex- expert playing look like? Right. Um, I think that Pathfinder uh, does such a good job of gating things by having levels, mm-hmm. uh, level requirements for your feats. That if you're at level eight, and, and even if you remove the the need for uh, archetype dedication feats entirely, you're still not going to really be able to get overpowered because you're still gated at level 8 stuff. You just can't pick up that level 10 feat that really gives you the juice. You know? Right. Like level 10, then everybody has access mm. to their level 10 good. Um, the, the balance is just incredibly powerful in, in Pathfinder 2, uh, and I mean that in the sense that um, like we were talking about in, in 5th edition, if you are uh, if you are really uh trying to squeeze all the all the optimization you can out of fifth edition and you go with a hexblade warlock with pole arm and they've taken pole arm master sentinel and uh they're doing everything that they possibly can you know we uh, everybody kind of um uh has, has heard of this one you know the, the, okay. the power of this hexblade warlock is also you know multi-class into something else probably fire <laughs> um that character is probably like five times as powerful as an unoptimized character. Like in terms of mm. damage output, which is basically the only real metric of success in fifth edition. Sure. Damage output, because they don't have the emphasis on conditions that mm-hmm. uh, you have. Um, and so, you know, if you do like a super ultra, ultra optimized, you know, whatever, you're gonna be attacking like six times a turn. Uh, you're gonna be hitting like a train every single time. Um, and it's, it's, you are, you, the one player are now outshining the rest of your party in terms of damage output. Mm. Um, and that, that's not necessarily the best balance. If you come into Pathfinder 2, uh, and you are like really looking to crack this game open as much as you possibly can, and you do the most munchkin stuff you can, (laughs) and you really... You know, you're playing the human, the fighter, you got the full plate and the yada. You are mm-hmm. maybe, maybe, maybe 50% stronger than somebody who just came in and said, I'm going to take a champion 
that you know a level one just that's that that was written about in the book. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the bold right. advice right, right from the book. You know the the pre gen or you know I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a dart I'm gonna throw darts at the book and figure out what beats what my character choices are gonna be and what my ability boosts are and everything. Like you do that. And, you, and you, your munchkin might be 50% stronger than that, right? Like that is, um, that's another reason why free archetyping is not that big a deal. Is it, It's so gated by level and everything is so pre-written in terms of the majority of your strength that even if you do wind up having like a new option, you know, I'm playing as wrestler, not considered a, a pretty strong archetype. Goody gumdrops. At level four, I'm gonna have the ability to suplex somebody right like that's one thing and it's level four we're halfway through the campaign you know that's one more option that i get and it's a level four option it's not it's not that strong an option you have to have somebody grappled before you can even do it you know there's there's that and that's with me really trying to eke out every edge that i can get because pathfinder is a very difficult game it's tuned for every challenge to be really good and challenging um but Speaking of the challenge, let's talk a little bit about how uh, we've talked a little bit about these flavor archetypes and how ha adding free archetype gives you the chance to, to have these little flavor bits uh, without feeling like you're missing out on any of the power stuff. But let's talk a little bit about uh, archetypes that do give you power. Um, you know, things like things like the the wrestler uh, uh, give me the advantage of being able to I uh, get the Titan wrestler feat and uh, some other goodies from it. It, it does give you the ability. To, tackle some different challenges. Sure. Um, you know, if you take an archer, if you take the archer archetype, all of a sudden your ranged enemies are going to be a little bit less of a problem. So let's talk a little bit about combat as a puzzle in Pathfinder 2. Have you observed this in, in, our, in your experience in, in Pathfinder? Yeah. I mean, I mean, not with archetypes types specifically, because I definitely just go for this one matches the backstory that I'm telling about my character, but but yes, I have definitely noticed. Uh, oh, I lost my train of thought completely. I'm gonna pass it back to you. <laughs> Go ahead. No worries. Um, the thing that I find interesting about even these powerful archetypes is that uh, uh, combat as a puzzle often breaks out in Pathfinder, where, for example, um, uh, this one happens to us all the time in 25 North. Uh, Prakta is based around inflicting fear, uh, right? She's got the evil eye hex, uh, and it is probably our most useful uh, tool uh, that, that she has because those, that, that frightened status is incredibly powerful. Frequently, uh, I'm, I'm not sure she's actually been able to successfully get an evil eye off, in fact. This is how frequent it is. She will try to inflict it on a monster that's mindless. And that is part of the combat puzzle. Your usual toolbox, uh, you're, you've, got a, you've got a toolbox as part of your class, you know, uh, and then you, you might be able to squeeze an extra tool out of your ancestry. You might be able to squeeze one more out of your archetype. But you've got a toolbox and um, dang it, your usual tools don't necessarily work on this one. You know, this one is, um, this one has hardness. And so now, as a monk, I'm not feeling too great because I'm I'm built around you know two. Well, actually, I guess in the case of flurry of blows, you combine them. Um, sure. Let's see. Uh, uh, but as a fighter, for example, I would be I would be more inclined to do something like use a power attack uh, to deal with that. And if I don't have power attack, I'm not going to feel you know that that's that's a choice that I could have made to short circuit this hardness part of the combat encounter. If I had chosen power attack. Now I've got an extra die of damage that I can maybe pierce through that hardness with. Uh, alternately, you know, frequently you're going to see stuff like invisible enemy. Um, invisible enemies, that's that's a real bear. Uh, or even just enemy fighting in darkness. Um, uh, the good news is that you can take some archetypes or you can make some character choices uh, that will make it a bit easier to deal with invisible foes. Why Rodin has... Uh, I was going to say, your imprecise scent, yeah. You can you can uh, archetype into barbarian and take their barbarian rage scent, so that uh, when you go into a, an animal rage, you get their their keen senses as well. Um, and those those help you to tackle those challenges. Um, 
But what I think is really interesting about these combat challenges, you know, you take the archer so you can deal with flying enemies, uh, uh, is that um, when you deal with these, these combat challenges, these puzzles, when you solve the puzzle, you're still just reducing the combat back to its baseline, pretty difficult difficulty. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So even when you can solve the combat puzzle, and here I'm doing air quotes, uh, even when you can solve the combat puzzle, combat's still hard. It is still just teeth chatteringly hard. Um, so, like, if you as a GM are worried, oh, my, my, my characters are going to have uh, these free archetypes, they're going to have these abilities that will give them uh, this horizontal progression. We know that it's not going to be vertic vertical progression. You don't get a lot of pluses to your attacks right. from archetyping. That, that's not how this game is built. You don't, you don't get big numbers and stack them to the sky the way you can in fifth edition. Uh, what you can do is get more tools to solve more of these combat uh, puzzles. But as we mentioned, that just gets you right back down to, ah, uh, now now we're at a regular strength combat. Um, there there are some combat challenges that are uh, that are really just kind of a slog if you don't have the tools to deal with it. Uh, flying enemies in particular. Oh man, GM's really got to throw you a freaking bone if nobody's got a way to deal with flying enemies. What are, what are we to do? You know, that's going to be just a terrible slog. You want your players to have options to deal with everything because it is not fun for your flying enemy to just stay up 20 feet above everybody's heads and shoot at them with your, your five points of damage you rain down on them for a round, you know, right. or whatever. Yeah. And then there's nothing else they can do. And, but, you know, so that makes you have to dip into this like anti narrative of, oh, the flying. It landed for down, some reason. Yeah. Advantage. Right. 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 And so you you want your players to be able to solve these things. You want and and you want your players too to have uh, the, the pleasure of realizing that yes, I made a great decision to solve it. I took you know what I did with my combat flexibility as a fighter. I took blind fight. That's that and I, I and when we finally fight that invisible foe, I'm going to be just smoking it. Um, but the thing is that that invisible foe is still a level appropriate foe, so its AC is still sky high, right? It's it still has a ton of hit points, it's still doing a ton of damage. It's just yeah, I, I can negate one of its big advantages, and now we're on a, a more regular uh, right. uh, place. You take it from oh crap, I guess we're just gonna die, or hopefully run away to letting the players actually be clever and feel clever about solving, like you're saying, how to deal with it. And that excitement of, hey, I took this feat at level two and it's finally paying off is, you know, be very exciting for players, I think. Um, finally get that big payoff of your choices. Yeah, I think that really is, for me at least, that, that is like the big reason to play uh, Pathfinder over other tabletop games because um, the thing that I enjoy most about gaming is, number one, making choices, right? Uh, that, that is a really fun thing to do in Pathfinder by gum. If you're playing Pathfinder, you are making choices, oh, right? Yeah. Especially mm -hmm. in creation, you've got so many more choices that you can make. But number two, uh, is watching those choices bounce off of each other, right? That, to me, is the really big joy, is seeing if I can find a force multiplier somewhere or, you know, whatever. And so having these interaction points, as many interaction points as possible, uh, where my ancestry meets with my class, meets with my free archetype, like where I can use those to cover bases or, or to... Um, yeah, it's just the, the idea of... of uh, um, uh, for example, building toward uh, building so that you can. I actually recently did this with with my fighter who is a brawler. Uh, if you can build so that on your first action you trip somebody, right? That's that's a little bit of fun uh, brawling right there. That's like that's a combat maneuver. Uh, for my second one, my second action that turn, I combat grab. Now combat grab is one where you do a strike. Uh, and if that strike hits, um, you automatically grab your target. Okay? 
uh, it has the press straight, so it has to come number two in, in the line. You have to do something first in order to be able to do a combat grab. So, uh, so I, I successfully tripped my opponent, which is really great. Like that's, but that's that's something that's level one stuff right there. Um, level one, I tripped my opponent. Now my opponent is out in action. They're gonna have to stand up, and I can use my uh, my attack of opportunity to to take a, a multiple attack penalty free strike against them. Very cool, great stuff. Level one. Level two, combat grab. Okay, great. So action number one, I trip him. Number two, action number two, I do the combat grab. I successfully, I've, and, and this comes from uh, playing Abomination Bolts at level six for the fighter. Uh, so, you know, my level two uh, choice now comes into play with this combat grab. Now I've got them on the ground so that they are flat footed. I'm hitting at them using that flat footed from the trip. So my multiple attack penalty is not that onerous because they're now flat-footed. Oh, so that's a that's a neat little point where those two things meet. That feels very good. And then uh, when I successfully managed to grab it, oh, now it's immobilized. It can't stand up. It's not allowed to, standing up as a move action. So uh, because now it has to escape the grab. And uh, so wow, now I'm making it spend two actions just to get back to. It's neutral, you know, regular yeah. playing field of standing up, of being standing and ready to attack things. Furthermore, escape has the attack uh, trait, meaning that they have to escape, thus incurring the multiple pen uh, attack penalty. So even if they get around to that third action, finally swinging, that's going to be a multiple attack penalty. That's really good. Okay. This is two actions, two actions in. Okay. The third action I took was Dazing Blow, which is a fighter feat. That's a level six feat. You can only do it if you have an opponent grab. So, oh boy. All right, so that relied on action number two. Now, so trip, grab, now we can do the Dazing Blow. What does Dazing Blow do? Throw out an attack. It's a, your full multiple attack penalty. You're, you're kind of, you're, you're, you're not gonna have a ton of luck doing this one. But if you do, your opponent is now stunned one. Oh, <laughs> so, or, or rather, you you strike a grab's opponent, and then it has to do a fortitude save against your class DC. If it, it even you know, and and it works out very well. The the, the degree of success is even if it succeeds uh, at a regular success success rather than a critical success, I think you managed to get it stunned one. So the point is, in my three actions, I do my level one thing, my level two thing, and my level six thing. My level six thing completely locks down this i'm not gonna uh, maybe it's a giant hydra maybe it's a giant scorpion i'm gonna we'll, we'll call it a giant scorpion for now i'm not sure what it was um so this giant scorpion now is, is it's got an action missing because it's stunned uh it's going to have to escape if it wants to even stand up and not be flat-footed and be a sitting duck next turn i have now used my level one feature uh my level two and my level six uh feats all to bounce each other, to bounce against each other, and I've made this boss's turn just gone. Nice. Vanish like smoke. And now the rest of my team has got their their four player character actions to, to start, you know, taking this thing down. Um, that's the kind of that's the kind of thing that I really like about archetyping, and and that's the kind of thing that uh, allows that archetyping allows more of is the bouncing of these choices off of each other. And you know that dazing blow is, is not necessarily that much stronger than other choices uh, that, that you could take. You know it requires um, uh, that you that you have an opponent grabbed and, and pressed and you know all this other stuff. Uh, so it requires this multiple attack penalty that, that makes it a lot more bound. And everything is still you know level appropriately gated. Uh, it's just that every now and again you can bounce all of these things off of each other, and it is like a trick shot and pool. You know I I broke. That I broke that opponent, and everything went into the pockets. It, 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 and just when that lines up, there was a feeling that I had as a player that I could never, ever get in a million years of playing fifth edition, where I'm playing as a fighter, the same as everybody else's fighter, or, or as I'm, as I'm playing this hex blade, that's just the same as somebody else's hex blade. Uh, you know, it was all like. You sat down. You there, you mad scientist. You you worked at the lab. You know you you hit that blackboard. 
uh, for so long, and then you envisioned precisely this thing happening, and it came to pass. And it made me feel like, wow, what a tactician, what a strategist. You know, there was this this feeling of um, facing a test, almost. You know, uh, that that you just you just can't get unless it is all your choices and your actions coming together in a in a really beautiful. Yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, well, get, uh, yeah. go ahead. No, you're good. All right. Well, uh, all right, gang. Uh, so I was going to go ahead and call that a, a, a pretty deep little look at Pathfinder uh, 2E, their archetyping, multi classing, the roles that archetyping does, uh, uh, that archetyping plays, and all, you know, the options that it allows you. Uh, I hope that you, the listeners, had a really good time listening to this episode. 25 North Mutiny. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, and I've been Johnny, your and, hungry goblin. And Rachel. Uh, I think we decided on a slime. <laughs> <laughs> Ooze the boss. Ooze, yes. All right, guys. Have a good one. Take care. Bye. Bye.